This is James Taylor, and you're listening to The Creative Life. The Creative Life podcast is a show created for you, the creative. If you're looking for inspiration, motivation, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's a musician, writer, artist, designer, performer, educator, or creative entrepreneur. They share their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, their insights, and much, much more. In this episode, I speak with Corin Hebert. He is a business manager for creatives. We talk about the role of the business manager when it comes to creative individuals, discovering your target audience, and how to diversify your income streams as a creative. Enjoy this episode. Hey, I'm James Taylor, and welcome to the show. I have today a very special guest, Corin Hebert. Corin is a business manager to creative freelancers. And he cares about the why and how of making a living from one's passion. He manages talents such as world-renowned photographer and best-selling author David Duchemin. He is the author of Living the Dream, Putting Your Creativity to Work and Getting Paid, which is a business book for creative people. It's my great pleasure to have Corwin on the show. Welcome, Corwin. Hey, James. Thanks for having me on. So share with our listeners what's going on in your world just now. Well, uh, right now it's uh, it's well it's the fall season right now. It's a uh, the end of September, and most of my clients uh, all want to hit the ground running in, in September. So I feel like I'm at the end of a of a long runway of having many long nights. Um, you know, lots of scheming. In fact, most of the work we get done is in August. So while everyone's vacationing, I'm you know got my laptop strapped to my face. You know, hammering out emails, looking into website code. You know, being on the phone. So um, right now, my world is. Uh, uh, what, I feel like one day when I grow up, it's going to be Christmas time and I can actually relax. But um, uh, in, in my world right now, it's actually been a change in our business, moving um, from a, the downtown of Vancouver into a, a seaside um, kind of suburb. And we work from home now instead of um, from an office. So it's been sort of this life change that meant, you know, now I get a chance to spend more time uh, with my two and a half year old daughter. And uh, now the creative fires are burning in me <laughs> instead of just my clients, which is it was fun. So I was starting to pull out cameras and I was starting to pull out paints. Well, and I play Play-Doh because, you know, with a two and a half year old, you know, Play-Doh is a big part of the, the scene. You, but you don't have to use, um, you don't have to use children as an excuse to play with Play-Doh. It's a, <laughs> the Lego, that's, Lego. The, that's the children's excuses for Lego. Yeah. yeah. So it's been, it's been one of those things where, um, you know, sort of the, the personal life is starting to, you know, get a little bit more freedom right now. And, and that's been a really encouraging thing. And I, I described you as a business manager to creative freelancers. So in your role as a business manager, what do you actually do then? How does that work? <laughs> can I can I honestly say sometimes I don't really know. Uh, it's uh, there are times where I feel like I'm just making it up, and maybe that might be true. But the reality is is that the people that I work with, the artists that I work with, and the creatives that I work with, uh, you know, they have a special talent, or they have a really unique um, perspective on something, and they have a craft that is um, in high demand in the marketplace. So when they look at their business, they realize that they, they make their money off being creative and being creative on demand, which means that the elements of their business that are in support of that get harder and harder for them to do when they're busy being creative for other people. So my role is a little bit like an agent or a rep as I come in and kind of help make sure that they're focused on the right projects and they're working with the right clients and that they're maximizing, you know, like getting the, the maximizing those opportunities as best as possible, as well as saying no to things. And then, of course, it comes down to the roll of our sleeves and let's actually run these businesses um, better, you know, saving money or doing them, you know, efficiently so that governments don't come chasing them down for tax money or uh, just so that, you know, ultimately the creative people that I work with, if they're going to have sleepless nights or be stressed or worried, I want them worrying about pushing the creative envelope. I want them worrying about the skill that is undeveloped that they feel they need to hone in order to um, make the next next move in their work. I want them to stress about things that actually matter. So it means that you know websites and emails and email campaigns and um, a, a contract negotiation and banking and you know legal issues. Those are the things that I spend my time on to help them do what they do better. So I'm sure a lot of creatives are listening just now. You're going. 
that's perfect. That's exactly the kind of person I need. And I'm imagining that you're um, having that skill set and working in that way with, with other creatives, artists, etc. Um, you're very in demand for, for doing that kind of work. Um, so uh, one of the, the things like I'm guessing that you have to do a lot of the time is with, with your artists is kind of sit down with them, kind of plan out their year or, or a couple of years and, and, and work out for them which opportunities they, uh, they want to pursue. So for your own business, how do you decide when I'm sure you have all these creatives contacting you all the time about, you know, doing that same thing for them, being a business manager for them. How do you decide which artists and which creatives to work with and which art creatives you just have to say, I'm sorry, you're not either not at the right stage or how does it work? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, a lot of creatives are not at the stage where management makes sense. Um, you know, a lot of them want the benefits of having someone else do the, you know, do the admin stuff. Um, that's the way a lot of creatives look at that um, part of their business. But, you know, they they typically don't have the money to afford it and or their business can't support that type of overhead. I mean, in a lot of ways, as much, you know, and I, I would say much selling and selling is in, you know, air quotes, uh, as much selling as I do, um, I don't um, solicit on behalf of my clients. I don't pick up the phone and, you know, hi, I'm Corwin. You know, I usually don't have an accent. Hi, I'm Corwin. <laughs> I represent. I usually don't have a dumb accent when I do that. But, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't call. I don't cold call. I don't, you know, sort of chase down. I don't do marketing efforts that have that sort of, you know, I don't advertise for my clients. So it means that my clients have enough demand already that instead of hiring people to jo- you know to to and running a staff they just basically outsource their business to me and my team and we take care of you know all those factors so a lot of creatives can't afford that and should not spend that kind of money for those that are kind of so honestly early on it's kind of easy it's like okay well tell me about your uh, overhead tell me about your revenue you know if they're not if they're not generating uh, over $100,000 uh, a year, and we can't even flinch out a conversation about working together. So it's kind of hard, cold <laughs> facts. Mm. Creative people don't like having those conversations, and I certainly don't like telling someone how much money they make. But that's the reality: is that I'm attaching myself to a business that has to be working already to the point where it makes sense, right? This is the so when it comes to when they come to me, and I kind of know, okay, um, you know, if financially they can afford it, then it kind of comes down to their craft. And I honestly, sometimes I just have to say. Do I believe in this artist? Do I think they have the talent um, that the marketplace um, wants and needs? And do I feel like I can be a part of their creative world? Because it's, you know, it gets personal, right? It gets intimate. And sometimes I, and I'm not the artist, but sometimes I have to say things to an artist that, you know, impacts their creative world, something about their portfolio, something the way that they, you know, speak about their work, something maybe that we speak about other people and other people's work. And so it's, it's always a bit of a challenge. So I do find myself steering um, a lot of creative people towards like, how can you do this stuff better? Uh, because you're, you know, it's not the right fit or it's not the right time uh, for us to work together. And you, you know, shouldn't go run off and hire a virtual assistant from India. You know, you need to do these things better yourself. So I spend a lot of time helping creative people make better business decisions. You know, you know, they have to wear a million hats. So wear the hats better. Wear as few of them as possible if you can, but you know, like just do a better job and and, and then you'll get there eventually if you know, well at least I hope they will if, if they're willing to put the work in. So you so you're you have this kind of role as a almost the CEO of this creative person's company in the, in that sense. Um That's right. it's a kind of, COO. COO, yeah, yeah like COO. They they can they can trump me. They're they're the boss, it's their business. <laughs> but um I have a lot of um uh, influence over what happens and how it happens. Um, whether it's working with new clients or whether it's, you know, uh, an email campaign or whether it's a blogging strategy or what's happening on social media or pricing, that kind of stuff. And it reminds me a little bit of my, my kind of previous days when I was a, a more of an artist manager and what with kind of Grammy uh, award winners. And um, I always felt like a, a mixture between a CEO, a conciliary and a counselor. Um, at, at different yeah. points in that process. Oh, and don't forget concierge. A concierge <laughs> as well. There was that as well. Um, so when you when you're when you're working with these different types of artists, because I'm imagining for you as well, as you, obviously you have to believe in that 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 artist, otherwise there's no point in doing it. But you you're also having to judge opportunity costs for yourself because if you work with this artist, it means you can't work with maybe another artist. Um, so you're having to kind of make those judgment calls. How does it work? Because when you know, we, in, let's say in the music industry, people, talk, managers can normally manage anywhere between 
three, maybe five artists. Uh, agents are different because they're, they're really just on the selling side. So they, they're managing, they, may, they might have anywhere like 20, 30 artists on their books. But for a manager, when it's such a personal relationship, when you're involved in a lot in strategy and visioning with, with that particular artist, um, is, there, is there a number that you feel personally, you feel this is a good number for you, that you can feel that you can give all of your clients the best kind of service um, and mm-hmm. you know, the best of yourself? Yeah, I mean, the reality is I tap out at seven. Yeah. Um, you know, like I three to five, depending on the scope of their business and the intensity of the type of work that I'm doing and kind of where we are at, you know, in any given life cycle, you know, three to five is sort of, that's pretty pretty normal. Right now I'm sitting at seven clients and I want to, you know, I want to, I want to throw my laptop into the ocean <laughs> <laughs> just because, you know, I overcommitted myself and that's, you know, most business people, you know, have these ebbs and flows of, oh man, I think I really need to grow my business. And then you grow and you're like, I really need to downsize my business. Um, so that's the kind of, because yes, I mean, it's intimate and, uh, you know, I care a lot about the work that I do and I care a lot for my clients and the creative work that they do. And. Uh, sometimes, you know, often what happens is that my clients will come to me with an idea and it, you know, it's my job to make it happen, right? To, to execute on their idea. And, uh, and sometimes that takes a long time to do properly and to do, you know, based on the right relationships or the right opportunities or to sort of, you know, fine tune things. And, uh, so, you know, I don't have, um, short project cycles. The reality is I sort of have a, a bigger, that's why I'm not involved in production. If my clients need a producer or they need an assistant or they need people to get involved, we hire them. Um, and I'm not running off and holding light discs and, you know, trying to, you know, arrange logistics for stuff. Um, because if I get down to the project level, then I'm not serving my clients very well. So it, uh, it can get pretty interesting, but it does mean I spend a lot of time in front of my computer or in a boardroom or on a phone call. So for those people that may be listening just now, maybe they're, they're, they're doing creative work, they're it's really it's maybe a side gig, a side hustle just now, or they've just kind of started on those early points of, of making it their, their main thing, but they're not up to that earning over $100,000 yet from their, their creative work. What, uh, what are some of the, the kind of key advice that you tend to, the kind of perennial advice you, you kind of go to them with when they come to you and you, you, for whatever reason, you just, you're not able to take them on, they're not at the right stage, but you do want to help mm-hmm. them and you just say, well, here are the things that you should be focusing on, you should be thinking about now. What are those perennials? Yeah, sure. Um, the The first thing is uh, actually a, a kind of a marketing approach, and that is that they need to be focusing on drawing a crowd instead of trying to stand out in one. And a lot of creatives are trying to like you know kind of clamor to the top of the pile and and kind of make the most noise, whether it's on Instagram or wherever, and they're and they're just sort of like literally acting like kind of like they're holding up their hand saying, pick me, pick me, pick me. And whether it's, again, through it's being really noisy online or it's just being, you know, prolific with medi- mediocre work or whatever, they're just, um, they're just sort of, um, I was talking to a, a photographer and I asked him, you know, well, tell me about your target audience. I tend to say the word audience instead of market because market is a very bland, faceless kind of approach. So tell me about your audience. And he kind of said, his answer in short was the internet. Mm. And I'm like, well, okay, well, that's going to be pretty hard to sell to everyone who has a power button. Um, so, you know, we need to talk this through. So it, um, when a creative does things that kind of are a zag, when they sort of, you know, they don't have to be overly prolific, but they have to do something that gets people's attention. And what I like to see happen is when a creative can get the attention of the smallest group possible, and when a lot of creatives are, you know, kind of looking to stand out in the crowd, what they're forgetting about is those five or 10 or 20 people either within their closer in their world, I call it a sphere of influence, but basically you know, close to their world or at least one degree of separation, you know, like you have a mutual friend. So a small group of people, can you get their attention? Can you inspire them, challenge them, entertain them? A lot of creatives want people to just, you know, love their awesome work when in reality is people are People respond to things that entertain them. People respond to things that make them laugh or the things that make them think. So, you know, if, if a creative person is doing things that, you know, kind of draw a small group of people to them to say, we're interested, we like what you're doing, tell us more, like deeper inquiry, that's the, that should be the call to action when you're doing something in the marketplace. So 
Um, that, that's the first thing I do is kind of try to get them to think differently about their promotion and their marketing. It's not so, not so pushy. It's more attractive. The second thing is that I, I always, you know, it's 10 times harder to make money than it is to, um, uh, than it is to spend it. So a lot of creative people are just bleeding money because they think they have to spend it or they're not paying attention. Um, they've taken their foot off the gas. They're not aware of their, their, um, bank account balance. Um, you know, and it just, it's amazing how just a little bit of financial stewardship can go a long way. That's why tools like mint, at least here in North America, tools like mint, you know, it's a free service that you can download an app to your phone and kind of keep tabs on, on what's happening with your bank account and where you're basically spending money. Do what you got to do to kind of keep tabs on the money thing, because, um, it's hard to make money. And when, whenever a creative has to go get work in order to survive financially, their creative work suffers, their brand suffers, uh, and they're not going to get too far. So those are the two things that really, really stand out to me um, the most when it comes to you know that first sit down with someone that, that thinks they, they want help. I need to make sure they're on those two pages, that they're aware of their audience and they're dialed into their finances. That's great advice. And when you're working, I know you work with a lot of photographers, a lot of artists, um, visual artists, when you're working with them, when I think of photographers, I, I'm, I'm often thinking of them that they get paid for a particular, to do a particular piece or a particular piece of work. But how how are you thinking and talking to them, strategizing with them in terms of residual residuals and royalties and, and, and continuity and income, which is going to go on what, once they've actually finished the work? Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, diversifying a business's income stream isn't really important, right? Every business does that. And creatives tend to only make their money when they are doing the creative work. So it's definitely, it's, it's actually one of the reasons why a lot of business, um, uh, you know, uh, consultants and such kind of refer to creative freelancers, that they're not actually businesses. They're basically just workers for hire. And in a lot of ways, they're not wrong. Uh, if a creative person's business can diversify income streams to the point that, you know, if they were to take two weeks off, would the income stop? Um, if, if they can turn that around, that's ideal. So that's why, that's why um, blogging and or, you know, sharing online, you know, in a proactive way to sort of building that audience and then eventually selling something to that audience that is authentic and, and serves the, the needs of the audience. I think it's a great thing to see happen, whether that's, you know, ebooks or, uh, presets on Lightroom or Photoshop, or it's, you know, tutorials or guidebooks or, uh, you know, life lessons or whatever they can uh, disseminate, whatever, whatever information or skills they can transfer to the people that are within their audience for, a, you know, some exchange of value. I think it's really great. And there's tends to be a little bit of a, a backlash in sort of the general creative community where, you know, sort of it, you, if you can't do teach, uh, gets sort of thrown around. And um, I don't subscribe to that because if I think if someone who's talented makes money and makes maybe more money um, by doing kind of, you know, the skills training or, or coaching or workshop leading or instructing or presenting um, or writing, those kind of things, it's just a, it's just a sound way to make money. Now, yeah. of course, my, as a consumer, my expectation is their craft stays strong, that they stay sharp, and I will stop paying attention to them if if I feel like they're losing their edge or they're not v- viable in the marketplace anymore, I think um, they're the serial educators, unless they're actually really, really amazing educators, then, you know, those that have transitioned from, you know, talent to just, you know, you know, content pusher, then I think there's a problem there. But the, back to your point, diversified income stream makes sense. So I'm a big fan of writing. I'm a big fan of, you know, podcasts, big fan of um uh, speaking engagements or workshops or, you know, f- downloads that someone can learn about, you know, how you do what you do. So uh, I'm a big fan of that. Making money while you sleep is is really, really fun. And most creatives kind of forget about that part. And there's, I mean, obviously there's great examples now with the residuals. Uh, I mean, I'm thinking about things like Creative Live up in the Northwest, kind of not far from where you are just now as well, that, mm-hmm. you know, creating really great courses. Um, sometimes these aren't being, uh, you know, designed necessarily by traditional educators, but they're people that are really skilled. They might be great makeup artists or photographers or whatever their thing is. Um, but it, it does allow them to add that one more level. In fact, I'm, I'm thinking of just the other day, someone contacted me who's um, who does... Uh, 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 kind of camps, music in their case, music drum camps and things, um, and that adds another 
level rather than just continually having to do the the, the, the same thing that they're they're doing all the time. So when when you're working, because you're working with a di- these different variety of clients, where do you go to get your ideas, your inspiration? Because I imagine you need to keep stay on top of what the latest things in in marketing and branding and, uh, and 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 business building and protecting assets. So where are you going for that inspiration? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, probably due to the saturation level of my work, I tend to not pursue too many things. Uh, maybe, maybe that's a shortcoming in, in my world, but I, I keep um, my creative friends close and I like to have a diversified, you know, kind of social um, sphere. So, you know, I'm influenced by um, friends of mine that um, own and run um, creative agencies. You know, I'm not going to be working for them. I don't have you know, this, they aren't a fit for the work that I do, but based on their talent and things that they're doing, uh, in their work, I'm, I'm paying attention to the awards that they win or to the issues that they battle, you know, publicly or the things that they tell me over a beer. So I, I really enjoy the sort of the, the I, I like learning socially. I like, um, learning based on other people's experiences. And, um, so, you know, the, the, if I'm able to have, you know, a few extra coffees or a few extra beers, um, you know, with creative friends and kind of learn a little bit about what's going on in the background in their world and kind of um, I hear sort of the the road stories, the road warrior stories. Those are the things that spur me on the most when when it comes to the, the fresh ideas. Um, I usually draw from uh, parallel industries. So if I'm looking to ramp something up for a photographer, I am not looking to the photography industry to help me um, with fresh ideas. I'm I'm looking at whether it's performing arts or it's fine art or it's um, you know the culinary um, industry or whatever. I'm looking uh, for sort of this uh, this opposite. Um, I'm looking for ideas to spawn out of something that doesn't look and smell like what everyone else is doing, say in photography. So I'm always. I'm thinking about you know cooking is a is a hobby of mine. I, I love it. I I find the the, the food culture uh, now is um, so it's pretty jacked up. Uh, chefs and the system through are really dialed into really being creative with food, and I find that the process that a lot of the, the food industry is going through right now um, is quite inspiring, and it's and it's because it takes what is quite normal um, and it makes it um, you know unique. And special and uh, and photography and design and a lot of other creative industries sort of just end up um, I call it industry itis they sort of just they inbreed you know photographers mm-hmm. just talk to photographers and they make things that photographers will like okay <laughs> that's not going to serve your business very well it certainly isn't going to meet the needs of your audience um, your you know your target audience so I'm always looking for ways to kind of throw in um, you know a zag into the into the system because uh, if we just do what our industries do then um, we're going to be flat pretty quick. And that's really smart. In fact, it may, makes me think of, like talking about cooking, the uh, the guy who actually was really what the, the brains behind what we now know as these like super chefs and you see all the time, a lot of this came from the Food Network, uh, was formerly Alice Cooper, uh, business manager, um, who was being hmm. approached. He, he represented a lot of great music artists um, and not so great music artists. Um, and uh, he was approached by a chef friend a uh, very successful chef friend who said we're doing all these tv shows and we're not getting making any money from doing them and uh and I, I'm, I'm sorry i can't remember the name the the there's actually a documentary it's a netflix documentary you can find out and you can we can watch this the whole story but he essentially because the chefs weren't very good at the business bit the selling bit at that point they're obviously a lot better at now um he came in at his role was as a business manager but for he, t- he took his mm. skills he learned as a with music artists and he knew about branding and he knew about you know network rights and different you know tv and different things and he just translated that into as you said like a parallel industry and That's used great. those same same skills as well so it's all because of alice cooper it's all <laughs> it's all alice <laughs> cooper's fault that we are with it so i would imagine you know there's a lot of people listening just now who the thing you're obviously i'm guessing you're very good at is when someone comes to one of your clients and said, we would love you to do this thing and your client really wants to do it and it kind of works in terms of time wise and, and everything, but you have to then do the negotiation part. And a lot of creators have a mm-hmm. real issue with this, you know, negotiating over fees, conditions, etc. 
Is there any advice that you can give to some of those listeners just now who really hate that bit? Yeah, they, you know, they, they hate it usually because they're not prepared for it. They hate it because they haven't asked themselves, they haven't asked their business the hard questions and they haven't finalized, you know, their approach to the process. So when, uh, if, if a creative is having to negotiate, um, in such a way that they're kind of picking numbers out of the air or they're um, kind of making up terms, you know, specific to that project um, for the first time, it's a really dangerous position to be in. When uh, a, good, a good business organizes things like pricing and terms and conditions ahead of time, typically with a lawyer <laughs> to help them sort out, you know, what's important so that when it comes down to negotiating that a creative has a path ahead of them when they learn, okay, um, I'm going to be restricted from doing other work with other clients based on time or, you know, non-competes. Okay. That's this issue that affects the, the price or this scope here. And they have a bit of a, a bit of a roadmap or a matrix to kind of make a business decision because a lot of creative people make negotiating personal. They, it's too intimate for them. And I'm not sure why that is the case, but it quickly becomes, um, very emotional and that you have to take the emotion out of negotiating. You honestly do. And um, when when a creative has some uh, contract stuff established. Now, I'm okay, by the way. Uh, a lot of creatives with uh, kind of feel like there's the battle of the contracts. Well, I'll sign yours, but you have to sign mine. And and a lot of creative people, you know, tend to not do work um, with without you know uh, with a signed contract. Um, the the short answer is there is that if if your contract um, isn't going to get signed, then you have the option to walk away. A lot of people are paralyzed by that. But the reality is that if you're comfortable working with them not signing your contract, then so be it. That's fine. You just have to know that um, you know, you're just taking on an unbelievable amount of risk. If you're comfortable with that, that's fine. If you're willing to walk away, then you have actually graduated <laughs> into real business person uh, world and into, into the grown-up world because saying no to, to money is one of the hardest things in business. And if you feel your contract um, terms and conditions are important to have them ag agree to them, then sign. Anyway, back to negotiating. It really comes down to um, having your ducks in a row so that when it comes down to money, time, conditions, you know, um, issues like that, it really is about checking boxes on a piece of paper that you've said, this is a piece of paper that's important to my business. And it's just the facts. Because then if someone says, well, I don't like that, you can say, okay, no problem. That's one thing. Let's talk about it. Let's see if there's a way that we can work around it. Um, and often it's usually the issues are small. And uh, so one of the ways when it comes to negotiating, a lot of creatives like to break out all their expenses or they like to sort of, you know, have multi-line item budgets. As far as I'm concerned, all of those things that go into it, the travel, the logistics, the rental gear, the, you know, the whatever, the flights, the parking, the meals, all that just that's just cost of business. Include that in a project fee. Try to not break out uh, money as, as much as you can because it just it distracts the buyer. It totally distracts them and they don't understand why you need $75 a day for a meal expense when you're traveling 800, uh, you know, miles that day. You're like, so, well, yeah, so it's like, <laughs> always a bit like the chef analogy where if I go into a great restaurant, I, I don't expect them to detail how much paprika was used in this, uh, this dish. How, and you how certainly many don't want to know how much paprika costs, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. right? So wait, you use two cents of pepper on this? So, you, so it's basically this, this basically just moving from this idea of yeah. charging per, per unit per hour to charging yeah. per value that you're able to give yeah. to that client. That's right. And the last thing is, is that uh, when a creative says an, an amount, like a bottom line, they need to say it and shut up. If they're, if it's verbal, then it's like, I'm $5,000, then say that number and stop talking. A lot of creatives negotiate themselves out of their fees because they're, they think they're reading body language or they think they're trying to be, you know, the nice guy. Just say your number, let the person respond and then go from there. A lot of people just don't know how to keep their mouth shut. Yeah. Great advice. So this is really wonderful stuff as well. Thank you so much for kind of sharing this with our listeners. So going back to your own story, 
Can you tell us about a time where you worked on a project and you gave it your heart and your soul, but for whatever reason, it just didn't work out like you'd hoped? And more importantly, what were the lessons that you took away from that experience? <laughs> mm, so many, so many. Uh, I had a really, um, I had a really great experience um, uh, back in 2009 where um, my wife, Eileen, and I, we worked together. We started a conference called Creative Mix, and it was in prior to – everyone now knows as, you know, TEDx, Pecha Kucha Night, um, Creative Mornings, and, you know, all the other regional, you know, and, and uh, sort of the, the creative speaking events that are out there now. But back then, in 2009, there wasn't a lot going on. There was the TED conference, and then there was pretty much nothing else um, system-wide for creatives. So uh, we uh, created our own conference, Creative Mix, and it was a collaboration of um, uh, independent artists and creatives with industry creatives, people that were you know doing creative work, but for companies, and it was a collaboration event. It was an idea sharing event, and we had a lineup of fantastic speakers, um, all based out of our a city in Vancouver. And uh, it was a passion project. It was we this running running this conference was so much fun. It went so well, but financially, it was it was tough. It was a tough. <laughs> there's nothing quite like trying to sell tickets to creative people uh, for an event because. Half of our audience were broke and the other half, you know, couldn't get, you know, professional development funding for it because, you know, it wasn't an Adobe conference. Um, so we, we learned a hard lesson there. But the problem was, is that we didn't learn it well enough. And we did the conference two more years after that. <laughs> so at the end of three years, we had an amazing um, culture uh, that we had created, a, an amazing community. It was a real great celebration of creativity in the city. Um, but it personally came at a, at a great, you know, risk and that is just, it was a very expensive endeavor. Uh, and so, uh, you know, what I learned in that process was, you know, sometimes good ideas are just expensive and, you know, I hadn't quite come to terms with that probably in the end, I probably should have waited, you know, a year for, you know, TEDx to show up and just gone and supported. <laughs> I should have just volunteered at a TEDx event the following year probably would have been the better way to go. But, um, you know, it was one of those personal events that I just, we just cared deeply about and, uh, and kind of learned about how expensive it is to try to, you know, draw people together and to do something really professionally. So uh, that was one. The second one is um, I wrote the book Living the Dream, and uh, my audience is very small. I, I tend to not spend a lot of time growing my online audience. Maybe it's because I'm too busy working for my clients. But um, it meant that when I finally had my book come out, um, you know, I had already already beat the hundred people over the head that I knew would buy it. Um, and uh, I've learned the hard way that publishers don't. Um, sell books, they distribute books. And, uh, and so I learned the hard way that um, having a book out in, you know, in bookstores everywhere really only means there's one copy in every bookstore. And after six months, the bookstores send those copies back mm. to the publisher. <laughs> yeah. So I think I have bought more of my own book than anyone else. Um, but uh, that's, that was a learning curve for sure. I, I think I had very high hopes for, uh, you know, having a real book out in the real world. Uh, and that was a learning experience. Those, those are kind of great reflections, you know, for a lot of our listeners just now who who are maybe embarking on that journey to write that first book as well, just in kind of ensuring that you're kind of building your your platform in a, in advance. Uh, you're building that in advance. Can you tell our our listeners also about any any kind of key insights you've had or light bulb moments in this journey you've had as a as a business manager and as a creative yourself? Any times where you've gone, okay, maybe this is a direction I need to be going with my work. I need this is the zig to to other people's zag. Mm -hmm. Um, you, you know, in, because a lot of my work is so, you know, it's, it's the, it's the trenches, right? It's like I said, it's dealing with, you know, government tax office or it's lawyers or it's, you know, the, um, web developers, which they're the worst. Um, <laughs> but to, you know, in order to pull work off, we have to, you know, do, do these things. And, uh, about a year ago, I realized that, the creative work that that is flooding the market right now, like let's use photography as an example, because the majority of my work is within the photography industry. There's the barrier to entry is really low right now. Right, a lot of people have access to really great camera equipment, and uh, probably thanks to the Instagram culture um, and iPhones and such, you know, the creative eye is kind of it, it's a lot more common now. A lot of people feel like okay, basic composition. 
you know, having a bit of a style or aesthetic or kind of, you know, what they're photographing and how they're approaching, you know, making the eye photograph. There's just, there's a lot more talent in the marketplace. Buyers have a lot of options now. Instead of one or two photographers, they have to narrow it down from 20 or 30, or they don't want to make that decision at all. They just ask their friend to take uh, pictures. So it's, it, you know, in general, very general terms, the marketplace has a lot going on. And about a year ago, I realized that uh, talent has absolutely nothing to do with the majority of the big buying decisions because, in, especially in, in the creative industries like photography, talent is implied. It's assumed by buyers that everyone is amazing. So the buying decision is getting made off relationships. And when you hear people complain about, oh, that guy got that job because he knows someone, <laughs> I, I would expect so, mm. <laughs> right? A lot of great business relationships, come, partnerships come from uh, friendships and from people who know someone. That's because the buying decision is based on trust, not talent. So a year ago, I realized that, you know, I need to spend more time building great relationships. I need to spend more time, um, you know, building trust and making sure I do what I say I'm going to do and kind of go out of the way to, to foster um, friendships with my clients and to the people that I care about. And so it was sort of this, it sort of was this reprieve from this idea of building a business and growing and marketing and doing all the sexy things that, you know, make me or my clients popular and just focusing on, on people. And that was a bit of a wake up call for me because I think I had my head down, um, you know, in the sand and I just was working. I was and uh, my clients were working and it was, it felt, you know, a little bit like a machine. So I think the idea of just focusing on building better trusting relationships uh, has its value both in our personal life and in our vocational life. And I, I think that's a great insight. I mean, it's what you're saying there, you know, talent is implied. It's all, it's really like talent is just your entry ticket <laughs> to get into the, into the, into the game. It's, uh, it's all, it's the other things you have to relationship building, all the other things that you have to do around that as well. It's, uh, and we hear that obviously from, from other things with great speakers, being a, you know, a, a, being able to give a great speech is just the en entry ticket to, <laughs> to be able to, to do it. Then you've got all the other things that have to kind of go on around it as well. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have an online resource or a tool or an app like Evernote uh, or Gmail that you love and you find really useful for, for your business and for your clients? Yeah, you know, um, recently it's been Slack that has um, helped the most in, in our business because of all the you know clients and projects we've got going on. It's really nice to have you know, sort of real time conversations without it being, you know, I message on my phone, because um, I, I hate my phone, I like to not have my phone turned on. Because <laughs> it's uh, to to um, when people call, they expect my attention, and I rarely have it to offer at that time, uh, at their whim, not my own. Um, so Slack has been really helpful to kind of keep um, conversations um, going. And, uh, you know, limiting email has been really helpful in that case, because um, gigantic emails, like when I open my laptop and, you know, hit send and receive, I, my blood pressure goes up, you know, the, whether it's 25 or 125 emails that download at any given time, it's just like, oh, I just, it sucks the life out of me. Whereas a Slack conversation, it might be the same, you know, question or issue or message from a client or a, a, a coworker. Um, but it doesn't take the life out of me like an email does. Um, and emails just get piled up, right? You're always yeah. dealing with this gigantic pile. Uh, so I just, I really have enjoyed Slack. It's been a really great tool. And again, I mean, I'm working with a lot of independent creators. So, you know, Slack is not just for an operation. It can just be for one-off conversations. Um, but it's, I found it really helpful. That's great. Um, I, I have used Evernote. Um, I, I use it as a, you know, sort of scrappy note taking. Um, but I don't, um, I, when I first started into it, I was like using every integration and every sort of bell and whistle Evernote had to offer. And to be honest, now I kind of use it as my, you know, I just barf on Evernote and it's kind of helpful just to make sure I don't lose something and that it's available on my phone if I need it or vice versa. But um, it's not, you know, the end all be all. And there's plenty of other tools out there that are similar to Evernote. Um, so I wouldn't, um, it hasn't changed my life. But it, the end game is I use my Moleskin a lot and I, I take pictures of important notes and I make sure that if my Moleskin goes up in flames or my computer dies, you know, the things are in the cloud as much as possible because, uh, you know, bad things happen to things with power buttons. And, yes. Uh, um, or to, you know, backpacks or, you know, camera bags or whatever. So 
it's nice to have, you know, a, just a few tools in place so that if, when, when something goes wrong, um, you know, you're not devastated. And if you could recommend just one book and one record, one album to our listeners, what would they be? Oh, my word. Those are the hardest two questions you've asked the whole time. <laughs> oh, I'm so stressed out. Okay. So when it comes to an album, my uh, probably my, my favorite album is We Are the Same by The Tragically Hip. It is, uh, a, especially if uh, on a rainy day, but um, We Are the Same by The Tragically Hip is a really fantastic album. It's got a great, the whole like first song to last song, it's a great experience. That's my expectation on albums is that um, I don't like albums with really great one hits um, because um, the rest of the album is usually, you know, too conceptual or too awkward. So I like albums that have a full experience and We Are the Same has that. So that's that. That was okay. That I got that one out of the way pretty good. Now to, Now to the book. Uh, I'm, can I, I'll answer with two books. One is because one book, um, actually, um, I felt a real intimacy with, um, with my line of work. And that is, um, you know, I'm dead when I stop talking or something. I'm fine. Now the name is it's by Jerry Weintraub. Jerry Weintraub was the, um, agent for Frank Sinatra and he's the agent for, um, George Clooney. And he's just, you know, one of those Hollywood guys. In fact, he's behind the ocean 11, like ocean 11 series. And he was the loud American businessman on the on the boat where in in the first anyway long story, uh, but Jerry Weintraub is a fan, his book is fantastic, um, a real insider's look into sort of the life behind the scenes of creative talent from you know some of these actors Brad Pitt and all these guys, so I really like that book. But for sort of for the the general audience, um, I think um, Seth Godin's Lynchpin is a really important book, and though I will say that once you've read the first um, third of the book, you've kind of read everything that you need to read. But the first hundred pages is probably one of the most important because he just whaps the reader over the head with, you know, what is it that you're doing? What are you bringing to the world? And, and you know, how can you be so solely focused on it that you actually make, make a mark in the world that you're living in? And uh, I really like Lynchpin. Great. And we'll put all these people, go to jamestaylor.me, type in uh, Corwin Hebert. You're going to get all the links to what we were talking about today as well. Final question, Corwin, let's imagine if you woke up tomorrow morning and had to start from scratch. So all you've got are the tools of your trade, your phone, laptop, and the <laughs> knowledge that you've acquired over the years in doing the work that you do, but you have no contacts, no one knows who you are. How would you restart? Man, you're just hitting them out of the park. Oh my word. And I knew you were going to ask this one too. So, um, for me, I think that the, the reset button, I think I would in a parallel, uh, effort, I would focus on my own creative endeavors to the same degree that I focused on meeting the needs of my creative clients. Mm. I think that, um, when I have my head down and I'm focused on, you know, running my business and dealing with my staff and helping my clients make money, uh, I'm though I'm not an artist, I wouldn't consider myself an artist, at least not in a vocational sense or professional sense, but I am creative and whether it's, you know, taking pictures or painting or it's, um, you know, doing something in, you know, in, in Lightroom or in, in design, or it's, uh, working in the kitchen with great ingredients and, you know, and, and making, you know, colorful plates of food or, 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 um, dabbling in music. I'm not a good musician, but I, I'm a thespian. I, I think that I just, I would want to have more time dedicated to being creative on my own so that my creative fires were kind of always stewing versus, cause right now I feel like I'm always re-entering the, my creative life. And, um, it usually is bumpy and awkward and a little bit, you know, is it, it it can be frustrating for me personally. So I think that that's, that's definitely one of the things that if I were to hit the reset button, I would carve out more intentional time to be creative on my own. Well, that's a wonderful response. Actually, it's very interesting because we've had a number of uh, other people on the show before whose um, jobs I would describe as kind of helping promote the work of other creatives. And uh, it's actually, it's, I've heard it a number of times when they say to do to, to hit that restart button, uh, as, as great as they are at being able to help other people promote their work and get their work to larger audiences, uh, just to take a bit of that time to, to focus on their own creativity and, uh, and starting to build something around that would, uh, would be very, uh, very powerful. 
So, Corwin, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure speaking to you today, learning about the work that you do. What's the best way for people to connect with you, learn more about your work and your agency and any other projects you've got on the go? Yeah, the simplest place is just to go to CorwinHebert.com. Wonderful. And we'll put all these sh- on the, the show notes as well. Corwin, thank you so much. I wish you all the best uh, with the, what you're doing and, uh, and seeing you go from strength to strength and seeing your artists go from strength to strength as well. Awesome. Wonderful. Thanks, James. Hey, James Taylor here again. And if you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.